This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up, a special blockchain episode. We'll have a detailed look at the revolutionary technology. Plus, the co-founder of BTL Group and the CEOs of Atlas Cloud and Clinical Blockchain Data Sciences. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. There's no shortage of companies with big ideas about the power of blockchain. Many have detailed plans about how to apply the technology, but they often forget about the factor most crucial to their ultimate success or failure, and that is developers. Any platform is only as good as its applications, and BTL Group is catering to the people who put them together. The company operates a blockchain development network called Interbit, aimed at the enterprise market. Its secret sauce is that it leans on familiar coding languages like JavaScript that app developers know and love. As a result, they can quickly and easily develop a wide range of blockchain applications from energy trading to transaction processing and beyond. That places Interbit on the upper right of this chart, high speed development with high functionality. BTL Group already has some top notch brands exploring blockchain solutions on Interbit. The most recent collaboration comes between oil and gas super majors and energy traders such as Total and Vattenfall. They'll use the platform to settle and deliver gas trades. It's one of the first of many revenue generating applications BTL hopes to launch this year. Co-founder and director Guy Halford Thompson explains what's in store for BTL in 2018. Guy, your technology platform called uh, Interbid, you That's say is, is private, it is uh, scalable, it's simple. Could you explain it in, in layman's terms? Yeah, so Interbid is an enterprise-focused blockchain technology. So people, a lot of people are familiar with Bitcoin, Ethereum. You know, these are public blockchains that anyone can participate in. Uh, public networks is a single blockchain which has a copy of all of the data. So anyone can access that information. And that's just not suitable for enterprise. In an enterprise environment, you have a lot of data sensitivity, a lot of privacy issues, uh, and ultimately your use cases you know, have boundaries often you know, within a company or within a group of companies. So we've designed Interbit to have specific applications to enterprise problems, particularly where data sensitivity is a big issue, uh, and particularly where you want private blockchain networks that perform specific tasks, so think of a consortium of oil and gas companies, they're solving specific problems and using Interbit to solve those problems. So you mentioned the oil and gas companies, that's one of your pilot projects with the likes of BP and Total. You've worked with Visa Europe, uh, you've worked with uh, uh, fantasy sports leagues. So tell us what came out of those pilot projects and what else you're working on, what are you discovering? Absolutely, so my focus for BTL and Interbit has always been build technology and, and test it in industry. Uh, so as we started building uh, Interbit, we worked with Visa Europe uh, and six of their client banks. So that was applying Interbit to interbank settlement. Uh, a lot of learnings out of that, both from the application itself and also for ourselves on how to run these pilots, how to interact with these very large companies. Uh, and then last year, we ran the first phase of our uh, energy pilots. That was with four companies. Uh, a lot of that was focused around the governance, focused around how to structure uh, the project, how the technology would apply to companies in the industry. And obviously we're really excited that that's now turned into nine companies, so more companies have joined that project. Uh, and that kicked off at the end of last year, so by end of this summer, uh, that will be complete. Uh, and we will have, hopefully, a uh, interbit based gas trading project or gas trading platform uh, alongside the production system. So this is beyond the pilot stage, the concept been validated, this is companies now looking at you know, how do they roll this out across their infrastructure. And that to me is very exciting uh, because it's, you know, it's going to be the first real application of blockchain technology in the industry and you know, enterprise is where the biggest cost savings is going to, going to be seen when it comes to blockchain technology. So you say you want to have a live launch of Interbit within a couple of months time and then you're going to start having some meaningful revenue. Can you give us uh, some numbers there? Yeah, so Interbit's due to be launched in a couple of months time. Obviously it's been uh, you know, a lot of work over the last few years iterating the product and getting it to where it is today. So that launch is a really exciting milestone for the company. Uh, so along with the launch, uh, you know, we're moving, 
the, the model for BTL is traditional enterprise licensing. Uh, so you know, we work with companies on, a, you know, it's no different from big data or cloud computing or analytics, which these industries have gone through over the last kind of decade. Blockchain is just the next application of technology to big enterprise. Uh, and so our revenue models are no different from big data analytics or cloud computing. And our expectation based on, you know, our expectation if the pilot goes well, uh, is for these companies to be licensing in a bit on an enterprise license model. BTL Group has $10 million in cash, no debt. How do you plan to deploy that? Uh, so marketing, as far as deploying the capital, uh, a lot of marketing. Uh, I think you know, we've actually raised uh, a little bit more than that, okay. so it's you know, a little bit over $10 million. Um, focusing more on marketing, uh, increasing our London-based team, so a lot of sales uh, guys are, are joining us in London, uh, being more promotional around, uh, you know, we, we don't really talk a lot about what we do. We've put a lot, of, kind of had our heads down and been focusing on building the product. Uh, so a lot of it is now getting out, telling the story more, uh, and I think you know, the timing is right. You know, we spent two years building this product, uh, educating our clients, making sure that what we're building is actually what they need. Uh, and I'm really, really excited for this year because we've got our product launch. You know, we know that we're launching a product that clients are lining up to, uh, to adopt and roll out in their infrastructure. Uh, and from an industry perspective, our clients are also more educated and understand how this is going to apply to their industry. So as far as deploying that capital, it's really it's enabling us to grow and build momentum into a very, very critical year, uh, not, you know, not just for blockchain, but for BTL itself. Most of the data that's, uh, that's ever been created has been created in the past two years. You need uh, a system for analyzing and, and making sense out of that data, and that's what we do. Where, where we, I think, really shine is, is we're, we're a turnkey solution. We have uh, hardware uh, products that we can put in place. We have telemetry that we can put in place. It's uh, all cloud-based, and uh, we do it all for you. The price of Bitcoin may have taken a hit recently, but it's still the most valuable cryptocurrency by a wide margin. That has hundreds of would-be Bitcoin miners rushing into the space, hoping to grab a slice of the lucrative market. The fierce competition has sparked an arms race of sorts, one fought with the highest of high-end computational power. As a result, the burgeoning Bitcoin mining business is one of the fastest growing electricity consumers on the planet. Here's a look at the Bitcoin Energy Consumption Index, which comes courtesy of Digiconomist. Bitcoin mining's electricity usage has more than quadrupled in just one year's time. The practice currently consumes an estimated 43 terawatt hours worldwide. That much energy would be enough to power roughly 4 million American homes. In fact, global Bitcoin mining eats up more power than all of the countries painted in yellow on this map. Bitcoin mining ranks 55th among nations in energy consumption, outpacing the likes of Peru, Nigeria, and Ireland. If it were to keep up this eye-popping rate of growth, Bitcoin mining would account for the entire world's electricity capacity by February 2020. Now, some economists take issue with that last figure, arguing it inaccurately projects the energy consumption of Bitcoin mining. Others say the estimate is roughly in line with their own. Regardless of the specific number, it's clear that Bitcoin mining requires an incredible amount of electricity, and those costs can add up fast. What's needed is a low-cost energy source to fuel that computational power, and Atlas Cloud has it. The company owns a 6,600-square-foot facility just a few miles away from the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. It's the largest power station in the U.S., and it offers a plentiful supply of some of the cheapest power in the world. Atlas Cloud purchases electricity from Grand Coulee at just three cents per kilowatt hour. The company is in the process of bringing online three megawatts of Bitcoin mining capacity and expects to upgrade to five megawatts by 2019. With a cheap power source in the bag, Atlas Cloud is aiming to become the lowest cost Bitcoin miner in the world. Now the company is racing to complete the launch of its operation by the second quarter of this year. CEO Fred Stearman recently joined us to give us an update. So Fred, this facility you're developing in Washington state, it's low cost. How and why is it low cost? And are your low costs uh, uh, secure for, for a number of years? Is it a long-term contract? 
Well, we're down in the Cooley City. It's actually called Electric City. We have a small a building, 7,500 square feet, five megawatts of power, and it's at 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour, which is really the lowest in North America. Do we have a long-term PPA in place? No, we don't, and actually no one does in the crypto space. But we do have, uh, across the river in Quincy, we have Facebook, Google, and Amazon with hundreds of megawatts under contract. So we're pretty you know, secure about where the power is going to go. It's part of an economic development diversification for the government, so it would take a long time to actually to change the uh, regulations around raising the power. But at 2.9 cents, we're pretty happy. If it even goes up 10%, we're even happy. So. Not an issue. So you're exclusively mining Bitcoin. Why just Bitcoin and are you looking into other cryptocurrencies? So right now for the next, the business plan for the next 24 months is specifically on Bitcoin mining. And why do we pick Bitcoin mining? It's the store of wealth. It's the number one cryptocurrency. But when you mine these coins, it's specifically designed, the miners, their ASIC chips, meaning the software to mine the chips is actually on the CPU. Uh, or really on the GPU. So they're, fi they're physically focused on mining that one coin, so you can't just change you know, willy-nilly to different coins. But 100%, we're Bitcoin miners, and that's where we're gonna stay. Are you concerned about the volatility recently in, in Bitcoin and, and some of these comments from people who say, oh, the bottom's gonna drop out, it's gonna drop 90%, and there are a lot of prognosticators who often are not correct, but they, they want to try to get ahead of the curve. Yeah, this is, a, this is a doomsday crowd. I mean, you, if you're in this space or you're in our stock, you have to believe in Bitcoin. And what people really don't understand is today our cost for the first coin coming out, it'll be April 10th, April 20th, will be 905 electrical costs. And with the algorithm becoming monthly 8% more com uh, competitive to get to that stage, Within a year, we'll have a $1,620 electrical cost to get to the same revenue. And fast forward three or four years, we could be up to $20,000 in electricity to mine one coin. So the long term is, if you believe in electrical cost being $20,000, and you believe that the costs are around 11, or the prices are around 11,000 today, you know there'll be some appreciation of that capital investment. Fred, you, uh, speaking of investment, you raised $14 million. So how is that money earmarked? So the first uh, the successful raise we did back in December, we're, we basically spent that money on the Electric City facility. There's an electrical build-out. So we, within like five feet from our premise is the transmission tower. And we're bringing in the, the power electrical distribution and the racking for the miners. We bought 1,000 miners, and we purchased another 1,000 more for that facility. And that's where the allocation of funds have gone. This is such a hot space, blockchain, as you know, in cryptocurrencies, and investors are trying to figure out who are the winners going to be. So convince us and convince investors that, that your company is going to be a winner. So where we're focused today is we own our facility. We can control our power. So at 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour, we have the lowest in North America, if not the world. We're going to expand into eastern Canada, central Canada. We're looking also at a facility in Montana, and we're looking quite diligently in northern Europe. But we want to keep our costs down to the 2.9 to 3.6 cents a kilowatt hour. We want to own our facility. We're not outsourcing the uh, operations center or the facility to keep our costs down. Because you have to figure that in the long term, and we're talking 36, 48 months for cryptocurrency, that's long term, we want to keep our costs as low as possible. And we're getting to the deltas of 25, 30,000 a month for a coin, per electricity for a coin. Those percentages in operational costs make a huge difference. And that's our differentiation. For many companies, we tell them that their data is like the Mona Lisa. It's incredibly valuable. Every large organization in the world right now has a 42% compounded annual growth in their data storage. And the old methods aren't going to work. Leonovus technology was built under the following assumption. All your investment in network technology and security technology and hardware, we assume it all fails and the bad guys are gonna get access to your data. With Leonovus, we're the last line of defense. Blockchain was dubbed the trust protocol by technology guru Don Tapscott in 2016 and has proven to be a fitting moniker. The technology has the power to bring unparalleled transparency, not just to the exchange of goods and information, but processes too. And that could mean big changes for the pharmaceutical industry, which isn't exactly known for openness and honesty when it comes to clinical data. The reasons why become clear when you consider the long winding road to developing a new drug. Bringing a molecule from idea to FDA approved product 
is a multi-layered process that takes several years and an average of nearly $2 billion in total costs. And that's for the successful candidates. Just one in 10,000 molecules will go on to be a commercially approved medicine. Most don't even make it out of the preclinical stage. With those long odds conspiring against them, clinical researchers often succumb to the lesser side of human nature, be it consciously or unconsciously. They'll often selectively omit certain details and play up others to favorably skew their conclusions. The practice is so commonplace, it's one of the main reasons why most published research findings are actually false. That's according to Stanford University. But the blockchain could change all of that. So it would be easy to spot researchers' exaggerations and white lies, and in theory lead to more impartial findings, replicable studies, and higher success rates. Researchers could also use blockchain to more quickly and definitively timestamp data, the patents, access funding, and share information. Clinical Blockchain Data Sciences understands the potential of blockchain to enhance clinical trials. The company has created a platform that uses Internet of Things enabled sensors to gather data on patients and log it into the distributed ledger in real time. From there, big data analytics study that information for biomarkers or anomalies that may point to disease or infection. Brian, the FDA has said that the clinical trial process is broken, and here you come, clinical blockchain data sciences, and you're, you're using a lot of buzzy words, Internet of Things, big data, blockchain. What do you guys do, guys and gals? What do you do? How are you different? How are you unique compared to what's out there and what's been going before? We actually exist before blockchain. So the, the company that, that we uh, acquired, the, the technology that we acquired, the platform, uh, has been in development since 2004. So they're using devices, wireless devices, that's the IoT component. They're capturing that data, that data is being analyzed, that's the big data analytical component. And what we have seen in the last uh, six to nine months is how we can utilize blockchain and make all that work better and actually make what we're building more appealing to uh, the stakeholders in the clinical trial process. Currently in clinical trials, and you alluded to this, there, there's a lot of uh, errors, underreporting, beautification of the numbers of the data, uh, falsification, so, so your solution would, would stop all that. Correct, yeah. I mean, the basis, of how, the basis of how blockchain works is simply like those old stories and old pictures and some of us like you and I would actually remember people who used to do accounting with what was called the ledger, those big paper books, one line item at a time all done in pen and if you wanted to change any of those records you had to put another line item in, strike out the old one and make a reference back to it in the column. That's blockchain. So the reason why it's immutable, which is a term that everybody likes to use but nobody really understands, is in blockchain, once something is a block in the chain, once data is a block in the chain, it can never be removed. The only way you can change it if it, if it needs to be changed is by adding another block that accomplishes that task and everyone has to agree to that change. So from that perspective, you can't have false data. What we can do is we can go right down to the device, identify the device within the context of the blockchain, and so you can't put your device or use a false device to create data. So we can take the individual, we can take the components and, and the physical characteristics, uh, the biometrics, so to speak, of the individual, whether it's eye scans or thumbprints, etc., and we can identify that person. The data actually gets so deep at some point, we can identify people by their patterns of movement. So we've got such rich data because we collect it 24-7 that we can identify you as a distinct individual from the person that we're actually collecting data from because your gait, your patterns, will create anomalies within that dense data. So how big is this addressable market that you're talking about? Well, the gross clinical trial market is about $59 billion a year. Uh, there's about 22,000 new clinical, like start from scratch, clinical trials started each year. Uh, so from our perspective, we really have the opportunity to capture both entire clinical trials as what you call a contracted research organization, because we have that virtual platform to do that. What we can also do is either uh, license out the entire platform or portions of the applications within the platform 
to other CROs so that they can use components or the entire platform to carry out the work that they're doing in clinical trials. Okay, let's talk numbers here, Brian. Investors want to know what your plans are. So you're looking to go public late Q1, early Q2, looking at your investor presentation. You'll have platform revenue in Q2, clinical trial revenue in Q3, that's the plan. And then looking out a few years, you're really looking to ramp up revenue and be profitable, I guess, what, Q3 of this year? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a huge overhead because we, we have the luxury of, of still maintaining our presence at the university. Uh, we also have the luxury of the university utilizing uh, some of our uh, brain power in other areas, uh, but we still have access to it. So we don't have those traditional capital startup costs that you would have in a tech company. Uh, the rollout from a revenue stream basis on the clinical trial side is to build out the platform. Uh, we're looking at really where the lowest hanging fruit is uh, to get blockchain backed up applications that literally stand alone uh, you know, it, within the platform but can stand alone as applications. Uh, we'll sell those uh, on a licensing or a subscription basis uh, to other entities that want to use them. And then we have our own revenue stream relative to getting CROs and big pharma to start using our own virtual clinical trial platform, which unlike some that have been announced by majors in the last two or three months, uh, this one has actually been functioning and collecting data uh, for the last 10 plus years. So we have a tagline and that's like the Desert Line Energy is the next producing lithium mine in the world. Not only at Desert Line Energy, we're ready to meet the demand of the lithium market today by coming into production now. We're also looking out into the future and we see a bright and opportunity for us to be a long-term producer producing lithium chemicals for the growing lithium market today and then into the future. If there was any doubt that a lack of security is the biggest existential threat to the future of cryptocurrencies, there shouldn't be any more. Not after the largest hack in the fledgling industry's history in late January. More than a half a billion dollars worth of NEM crypto coins were stolen from the Japanese exchange CoinCheck. It was the largest crypto heist in history, but it's hardly the only big breach. Now here's a look at the nine largest breaches of cryptocurrency exchanges to date. They total nearly $1.3 billion in damages and investors are unlikely to ever recover any of that money. A rather shocking study by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security found that one in three Bitcoin exchanges were hacked between 2009 and 2015. What's worse is that these massive breaches will only intensify as money continues to flood into the space. This cybersecurity conundrum is not unique to cryptocurrencies, of course. Juniper Research estimates the annual cost of data breaches will reach $2.5 trillion by 2022. Big corporations and governments are fighting back. Gartner expects them to bulk up their cyber defenses to the tune of nearly $100 billion this year. But small and mid-sized firms are particularly vulnerable because they can't afford to spend too much on security. Hilltop Security says it has the answer for them. The company has developed what it calls a military-grade cybersecurity platform that integrates AI, machine learning, and blockchain technology. It boasts the ability to predict and prevent attacks, as well as return business to normal immediately following a breach. Hilltop already counts the U.S. Department of Defense as a client and is branching out into commercial clients and cryptocurrencies as well. CEO Corby Marshall explains how the platform works and the market opportunity that Hilltop has. Corby Hilltop has what you call military grade cybersecurity. So explain how it works and, and how you're different from other companies in the same sector. We're cons we consist, our, our company consists of a, a group of military, uh, ex-military professionals. Uh, the Army, uh, the US Marines, uh, the intelligence community, Wall Street. So we have a very broad understanding of cybersecurity. That is our wheelhouse, that's what we understand. And we've seen the best and we've seen less than the best. And so when we created our product for the small medium business sector, um, we created it based on experience that comes from that, the depth of knowledge in that team. Now one of the reasons we're talking today is uh, because we're at Cantec obviously, but uh, you have blockchain within your platform and you've had that for several years. You're not a Johnny come lately. Tell us about that and also the, the AI aspect uh, of it. Yeah, so, so blockchain um, is, is become a, you know, a flashy buzzword. 
But it, it, from, from our perspective, the value is in the utility, the ability to do a trustworthy transaction with somebody you don't trust. And, and, and so we built into our early product um, the ability to not change logs like some malware might, or not change the results of a given transaction in a company. So we, we've been doing that for, for a long time. And in, in terms of AI, we, we are still exploring AI and deep learning as, as augmentation to how, how do we do a better job of, of discovering attacks before they occur. Now you're targeting the small to medium sized enterprise market. How, how big is the addressable market? What kind of business do you think you can, you can do here? It, it's a good question. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly large market because we're defining it as under a billion dollars in terms of what's small and medium business. And, and probably 80% of that market is underrepresented in terms of their ability to address the threat and the competitor. What people don't realize is how sophisticated the cyber criminal has become. They have customer service, they have product roadmaps like Microsoft or Oracle. It's not like it used to be in the old days where you have a disgruntled teenager. This is a very professional movement, not just organization, that, that is going to continue to be uh, more capable, and so uh, it, the, the market is, is you know, 80% of business under a billion dollars, so it's very large. And we had that uh, case a few days ago, or recently anyway, where more than half a billion coins were, were stolen. What was that company called, Coin? It, it, was, it was in Japan, and it was $530 million worth of coins. Uh, were stolen, and uh, you know, it's not going to get better for for the the, uh, the good guys, like for the people who are trying to protect their assets. It's I think that the the, the bad side of this is going to become more capable, and so we continue to focus on holistic, systemic uh, security of, of of the customers, and and that's that's our whole world. And any tools we use is because that's the best way to protect them, uh, be it their information, be it their customer database, or or, or cryptocurrencies. So take us out a year or two and, and tell us what revenue looks like for Hilltop and, and when you uh, start seeing profitability. In a, in a year or two, we expect to, uh, you know, to be um, in, the, in, the, in the five to $15 million range. Um, we're going to grow services revenue. Um, we're going we're gonna to stay focused on our core, which is our software um, and, and our software platform. And, but, and so the services are really to support that. And uh, we also, um, any products that we do develop that are hardware based, such as this, this, this hard wallet I'm talking about, um, are, are probably going to be distributed through um, other companies that are better suited to uh, sell a consumer product or sell um, a hardware uh, you know, based product than we are because we, we're, 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 we're focused on the core, which is protecting our customers. And lastly, Corby, what would you say to investors who are listening to this and saying that they have an interesting technology, this sounds really uh, uh, compelling, uh, why should I buy the stock? Yeah, our company's not about a technology. We're seriously focused professionals who have experience in cybersecurity. Um, we have in the past been up to the threat that we came up against in, in, in different contexts, and we are now. And so it's, it's a company that's very focused on uh, protecting our customers and, and changing the paradigm and, and putting the, the advantage back on the good guys instead of uh, letting the cyber criminals win, if you will. From the heart of the Financial District in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode. And for more great research and great investment ideas through our weekly digest and morning note, subscribe to CapitalIdeasResearch.com. Thanks a lot for watching and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.